good afternoon everyone it's our immense pleasure to have with us professor dr ns atri sir is professor school of biological and environmental sciences shulni university of biotechnology and management sciences and the topic chosen for deliberation is identification and taxonomy of mushrooms sir you are audible as well as visible and this uh, session is being recorded for youtube uh, please start sir the presentation is also visible please start sir thank you very much i am grateful for providing me this opportunity to share my views on this very important topic identification and taxonomy of mushrooms uh, i may for your information tell you that uh, for a short time i joined shulni university but now i have left that university i am a free bird now and whatever work i have done on mushrooms is at punjabi university patiala i started working on mushrooms in 1977 and since then i have been uh, working on this particular field mushrooms itself is a huge fascinating subject and has been referred as incredible creation of god by none other than st chang as you are all aware they are macrophagi and they represent both above ground and subterranean Uh, members of mushrooms above ground largely the lamellate fungi and uh, the subterranean ones like you have tubers you have rhizopogon etc you find them and all these they start fruiting during monsoon season when the conditions in the soil are favorable temperature moisture and ph etc everything when they are favorable and you find these coming up uh, and proliferating uh, in the uh, ecosystem it has been estimated that about 2.2 to 3.8 million fungi including mushrooms exist in nature out of which only approximately 7 to 8% are known and amongst them the estimated number of mushrooms is approximately over 1 lakh 60000 out of which approximately 16000 mushroom species are reported to have been described and out of these 7000 mushroom species are reported to have varying degree of edibility and they have uh, their medicinal utility they have nutritional relevance and because of which they are being uh, investigated and a large number of them are being domesticated now uh, because of their medicinal and, and nutritional uh, potential more than 3000 species spread over 31 genera are regarded as prime edible and these include both wild as well as those which have been domesticated and from india approximately 300 edible species belonging to 70 genera are documented and the place where i am sitting today uh, this is the nerve center for as far as mushroom investigation is concerned and uh, uh, directorate of mushroom research uh, icr solan and uh, there are number of mushrooms which are uh, domesticated here and technology is available about 4 to 5 species are being produced on large scale and as for historical perspective is concerned almost every civilization they recognize the relevance of mushrooms in food and medicines and uh, you can find references in literature uh, made the greek civilization made the chinese civilization or mexican civilization or indian aryan civilization everywhere you find uh, references regarding uh, utility of mushrooms and their relevance and nutritionists started investigating mushrooms after the second world war when food shortage became very severe and the need was felt for alternative source of uh, food of late increased awareness of people uh, about nutritional and medicinal value of mushrooms and uh, uh, about uh, uh, their importance in various uh, uh, aspects as far as human health is concerned uh, investigation to decipher their constituents and utilization has become uh, more important and a lot of emphasis is being laid now on these aspects the being low calorie food and provide best alternative uh, solutions for persons suffering from variety of ailments there are medicines available which are prepared from mushroom psk from 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 uh, trematis versicolor and you find uh, capsules of ganoderma available in market for uh, 
variety of against variety of ailments diabetes hypertension cancer aids atherosclerosis etc and because of uh, their relevance in human welfare uh, their characterization their correct identification uh, is of immense uh, significance so in this lecture basically i'll be deliberating upon various aspects of mushroom taxonomy which will involve uh, collection of mushrooms preservation of mushrooms uh, and uh, relevance of macroscopic microscopic features and use of modern tools a brief idea about that although the very next lecture is on molecular taxonomy so i'll be just touching it and uh, the limitations of uh, the traditional taxonomy that i'll be giving and besides that a brief historical idea how the people from the times immemorial they started looking at these mushrooms and they started uh, noting the important characters of these mushrooms they started looking at how we can differentiate between different mushrooms they started recognizing different characters of mushroom that is how the taxonomy of mushrooms uh, and the science of identification of mushrooms basically started to begin with uh, we find illustrations of uh, in some of the literature illustrations of different mushrooms uh, in illustrations of bolitus are there amanita are there and some of the uh, mushrooms are there in in great herbals clausius showed new details in mushrooms such as d current gills with the first for the first time the character of t current gills in pleurostrus ostiatus and presence of annulus in lepiota procera was Uh, recognized as one of the important characters for uh, demarcation of these or for identification of these mushrooms this bohen uh, separated these into edible and poisonous ones and subsequently uh, looked into different stages developmental stages of uh, tricholoma and agaricus campestris bohen brothers used generic name fungus tuber agaricus etc for the present day agarics and bolids and uh, basically all these were grouped to begin with under single generic name fungus and that was the uh, initial in the historical records if you see and it was during the times of john ray and magnol that main morphological uh, categories of larger fungi including mushrooms began to be reflected in their classification valent for the first time introduced solid versus hollow type criteria and presence and absence of annulus as the criteria for differentiating different species of agaric genus fungus at that time michelli used traditional criteria like presence or absence of volva whether growing in cespitous clusters or not and the mushroom colors etc for further differentiation basically uh, the recognition of agaricus as a mushroom genus for lamellate mushrooms uh, was for the first time uh, done by linnaeus in 1753 being the starting point for nomenclature of fungi uh, so it is from here that agaricus was specifically named although it was in broader concept and all mushrooms which we know now they were in agaricus at that time in pursuit in synopsis methodica fungorum used hymenial characters for classification of mushrooms they started looking into the uh, in, inner portions of the mushrooms looking into the spore morphology of spores and freeze uh, looked at the spore color and uh, critically uh, divided all mushrooms at that time known to him into these five series leucospore for white spore agarics hyporody for rosy colored agarics dermini for uh, spores with rusty brown color and pretelli for spores with purplish or dark color and coprini for uh, mushrooms with uh, black spores so these were the uh, this is how these uh, taxonomy uh, to begin with it started and people started recognizing different factors of mushrooms for taxonomic categorization Freeze in 1874 in Hymenomycetes europaei recognized 35. Splitted the genus Agaricus, which was recognized in 1753 in by 1874 into 35 Agaric genera, and these uh, were in in this particular document well recognized 
genera at that time. You could differentiate them from one another based upon uh, varied morphological features. As, they are, as for their occurrence is concerned, you think of any substrates, they are available. They are available from tropics to the temperate climate. I have collected mushroom even from the Rotang Pass, where you, mountains are snow clad for most of the times. So they are cosmopolitan. And especially, I will be focusing this lecture largely, primarily on lamellate mushrooms now. And, and they may occur solitary or they may be gregarious or may form fairy rings or in varied, varied forms uh, they may look like and in, in various ecological niches. So you have to be very careful while indulging into this field. You have to look into every aspect and jot down every aspect of uh, these, where they are occurring, on what substrate they are occurring, in what which form, what is their habit, what is how, how they are growing. Uh, uh, whether they are in association with, with some plants around that, what are the geographical coordinates of that particular area, all such things, they have to be jotted down. You can see here, this is Lentinus uh, sejor kaju. You can see it growing on a live stump here. And this is a penulous species here on a young. You can find many of them growing and occurring in fairy rings, Lepiota species, Agarica species, many of them, you find them. This is basically a grass disease where the fungus infects the grass. Mycelium is there and it grows in a centrifugal manner. Every year you'll find the dimension of the ring uh, growing gradually year after year. And uh, like that, as and when conditions are favorable, you'll find these mushrooms coming up in, in, in rings. And it appears as if uh, they are dancing. They have been compared with the dancing fairies. So you have very forms of these mushrooms. Uh, if you look at them, you cannot make out just by looking at which one are edible, which one are poisonous and uh, like that. You can find them, they grow on dead wood. This is a lentinous species. You can find this edible one. Again, this is on the root, mycorrhizal, rasula species growing on, 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 on the root, in association with root. On the leaf litter, and you can see on a rasula, you have Astrophora lycopardardis mushroom growing on a mushroom, or this is a coprophilus mushroom uh, here, psilocybe. And here you can find here termitum, termit, on termit area, termitomyces microcarpus on termit area. It appears as if these are blooming. So varied habitats uh, you find. So why do we need to do taxonomy, basically? Taxonomy is a science of uh, collection identification and naming. That is what taxonomy. And when we start studying evolutionary relationship, it becomes systematic. So why we need to do taxonomy? We need to do taxonomy to identify these creatures, which are so important individually, know them individually. That is why we need to understand them. So identifying mushroom requires basic understanding of their macroscopic and microscopic structures. So we have to separate them into edible ones and poisonous ones. And there is no single trait which can be used to differentiate these from one another. So almost morphologically, they look alike. They grow together. They grow in similar locations. So that is why we need to do uh, taxonomy to begin with uh, as far as uh, identification and characterization of mushrooms is concerned. You can see these are some of the, you have already seen the, the cultivated commercial mushrooms, Agaricus bisporus, Pleurotus, Volvarela, uh, Milky mushroom, etc. These are wild uh, mushrooms which are all edible and they belong to different genera. You can see and from just by looking at you cannot make out that they are, they are all edible. Look at this. This is one of the, uh, the name indicate deli Lactarius delicious, so highly delicious when it is cooked. I'm sorry, it has. Can you go to the PPT, sir? It has accidentally been... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, please do that. Yeah. 
is it visible yes 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 okay so you cannot make out you cannot differentiate them just by you have to study them individually they are all different you can see they are also they are all all edible species all coprinus cometus you have lentinus you have amanita large number of amanitas are otherwise poisonous but you, it is uh, edible one here rusula sinensis it is being sold in the market in european market it, it, for a very very high premium otherwise it is mycorrhizal and and these are all edible ones and these are the poisonous ones and you can see morphologically they look alike the amanita pantherina amanita flavipes and some of them are hallucinogenic so you can see them and you can not differentiate without investigating them individually so how to go about that will be discussing in the in the uh, forthcoming slides as for road map for mushroom taxonomy is concerned so to begin with you have to go to the field because it is a field science it is a, you have to uh, take field observations you have to during collections with regard to every aspect of these mushrooms you have to uh, gather them you have to you have to look them morphologically you have to jot down morphological characters you have to perform some macrochemical reactions there in the laboratory temporary laboratory you have to perform anatomical you can say investigations and subsequently maybe at some places electron microscopic investigations and all such things you have to do only then you can uh, you can uh, proceed further so it is of immense importance in the field to note down habit habitat shape texture color smell taste ecological preferences etc for proper identification you don't know which character is going to matter at at at, at a particular time when you put the uh, your disc description into a key when you start looking at it uh, for identification purposes so for collection purposes you need to have these equipments with you in the field a basket a hunting knife wrapping paper knot of paper score print cards hand lens photographic camera binocular to look at a distance uh, there can be some wild animals also in the fields and i have uh, met uh, during few occasions in the field so you have to be very careful you have to be extra alert and you have to have some eatables with you so all these things are required while venturing into this interesting field so during collection you need to collect on the healthy specimens you have to wrap each collection separately even if it belongs to the same species so you have to be very particular about that you don't know uh, many a times they are very cryptic even same species may be having different colorations you you find it you find it sometimes colors get swashed out and uh, the loses the original color and uh, that that creates a confusion that is why you need to collect them individually separately and pack them separately in in the basket and subsequently <coughs> if some other say mycelium is there pseudorhiza is there along with that you have to you have to gather them and uh, for culinary purposes young and sturdy ones should be collected as for macroscopic features are concerned these are features which should be recorded in the field itself because they lose they are fleshy and and many of them they can change their color to begin with when you will find in the field they are white to look at and subsequently if you put it into your bag or if you just remove it from the field and just after touching you will find many of them they start changing color and in the bag when you come to the lab laboratory you will find the same species which was white to look at in the field it has turned brown or it has turned even black you find many of the species like uh, rusula nigricans rusula adusta etc uh, all all such species they they uh, there's a lot of color change so documentation of microscopic characters of pileus scales type and uh, spore print taste other etc they are they have to be performed in the temporary laboratory in the field and you need to have hand lens to look at the surface features uh, coprinus groups which are very fragile and they they shrivel up immediately they have to worked out on priority basis fragile ones and those fleshy and viscid they uh, can take some time rough and leathery ones you can wait but otherwise 
coprinous and fragile ones, they have to be looked immediately. Otherwise, uh, they will lose their texture. They will lose their, uh, you can say, otherwise, organization. So documentation of taste of flesh, lamellae, latex, and documentation of odor of the flesh uh, is obligatory requirement. But you have to be very particular. It should not be amanita. With, which is having both vulva and annulus. You have to be very particular about that. As for the pileus and gill attachment is concerned, pileus you may have in fleshy fungi, you have uh, spores being produced on lamellate structures. They may be in pores, tubes, or in, in ridges, or in uh, hiddenum, you find tooth-like extension so as for gills are concerned they will be discussing the lamellate ones because individual uh, group is a full-fledged lecture in itself so i'm focusing on the lamellate ones you have to look at the attachment of these gills to the stipe how they are attached if they are attached broadly to this type then we call it adnate or they are narrowly attached to this type here next or they are extending down onto this type. they are extending down onto this type Decurrent or emarginate gills notched immediately before attaching to the stipe or free altogether. <laughs> so free refers to basically you will have when we remove the stipe, the, the gills will uh, not be detached. You will find a free circle in the center. I will show you subsequently. Seeding gills attached but breaking away from the stem at the margin when you remove the stem. Sinuate gills smoothly notched. Uh, and then running briefly down, sub decurrent slightly running onto this type. So all these features have to be noted down in the field. As far as pileus morphology is concerned, we have to look at the shape, how, how the shape looks. Uh, it may be bell-shaped, campanulate, or conical, or convex, or depressed, aplanate, or infundibuli form, ovate, or umbilicate with slight depression, or ambonate with ulva. And uh, there may be variation in the structure. It may be spinny form or of uh, varied forms you may find. So these are the important features which needs to be jotted down. This is how the free gills appears. You can see this type and you can see the free area around the gills. You can see the free area around the gills here. This is These are free gills. These are at next slightly attached onto this type, at late, fully attached to this type and slightly sub decurrent and decurrent extending down onto this type. This is how the gill attachment has to be looked into. And you can see the varied coloration in these mushrooms. And these colors, they have to be noted. And you have to give standard color notations. And there is one book by Corner Up and Wansher, Color Dictionary by Corner Up and Wansher. You have to have standard color notations so as to uh, note these uh, different colors so different shapes you can see convex umbrella like with the uh, center or you may have conical shape or of infundibuli form all these there are a lot of variation the, my uh, point of showing this is you have to look into these critically and you have to uh, jot down in the field itself and ultimately uh, note it uh, on a, a note paper and then margin of the Pileus, it also offers you an important character. It may be enrolled, it may be uplifted, reflected, it may be splitting variously, you can, it may be smooth, or it may be irregular, or a lot of variation uh, that uh, has to be documented. Or many a times in agaricus, etc., in those which have wheel, they may have uh, extending cortina uh, along the margin that is, that is there. Then striations on the surface, they may extend uh, to a short distance or they may extend from margin up to the center of the pileus. You have to note down translucent whether the light passes through the pileus, just like see, you can see through the pileus uh, from underside uh, upwards. Uh, then we call this and you'll be able to see these striations. They become apparent. So such situation we refer as translucent striate. Just by writing striate, will not, uh, you can say, give you that much, you can say, character. Uh, you have to look at it, it to it in this fashion, whether they are translucent or not. 
then scales on the spiny surface are very important presence of scales just by putting it at the scales present on the spiny surface that will not is not going to help of what type scales are there how they are arranged whether they are part of the permanent wheel uh, like that here you can see this on amanita on the surface scaly this is in case of clarkenda you can find a square of scales in the center the prunos or you can say a pressed fibrils you can see these fibrils here or radially splitting wheel remnants on the pileus this is amanita you can find it and when it it will open up and it will become like this and valve valve will remain at the base or a pressed fibrils so you have very you can say forms of scales on the surface in different dimension different patterns of attachment and also surface may be you can see these striations sometimes you have zonations on the surface you can clearly see the zones on the surface uh, with different colorations so all such characters needs to be uh, looked into critically when you are doing taxonomy and similarly gill margin is it, it is an important uh, it offers sometimes very important characters you can see here here the margin is smooth here you have a crisp margin you can see this crisp margin crenate you can see these dentate and you have colored edges colored edges differently colored than the rest of the lamellae edges are differently colored you find in in ursula aurata edges golden colored as uh, as compared to the rest of the lamellae serrate and like that you have lot of variation as far as these gill edges are concerned then forking underneath these lamellae may be equal in length right from starting from this type up to the uh, margin of the pileus running right through equal or they may be unequal in some of the cases you may have differently sized uh, lamellae and these are unequal lamellae you can see the the length of the lamellae this is one extending up to this this one is two extending up to this you can see this third one the fourth one the fifth one and the sixth one like that so you may have different uh, you can say rows uh, unequal lamellae or many a times they may be forking only along the margin you have this forking or they may be forking all over you have these forkings all over they may be dichotomously branched as in case of schizophilum commune you have dichotomy repeated branching of the lamellae underneath which is which is a diagnostic character of that particular genus then many of the mushrooms like uh, latex uh, lactarius and lactifluous they exude latex when when injured any part is injured you find this is a latex here you can see white latex you can see here and here and it is turning bluish many a time it changes color from white to bluish to greenish or or any color or many a times it remains Uh, unchanged and the taste of the latex is also many a times variable variable as compared to the flesh may be mild in taste but latex may be acrid in taste it may be uh, stinging in taste like that uh, it has to be noted down and color change if any and exudation whether it is copious or whether it is scanty and like that you have to note down you can see bruising also is an important character i referred you Uh, here you can see the bruising it is turning otherwise they are they are carrot colored wheels are carrot colored and you can see this bluish greenish shade where where injured you, it it develops it is developing brownish you can see these uh, patches here it turning yellowish you can see this type turning yellowish when when exposed uh, to environment so like that you have all such characters you have to be very critical while examining and they have to be noted in the field itself so you have to sit with a mushroom for about 15 20 minutes with a single specimen only then you can get some worthwhile data which can be of utility this type the macroscopic feature of types are also uh, quite important and variable and they offer various characters type color variation in this type color above and below the annulus you may have annulus on this type in many a cases i'll i'll show you in position whether the stripe is central or eccentric surface feature of this type 
presence of the mycelium at the base, firmness of this type, presence of wheel, all such characters, then annulus and vulva details, all these are very important. You can see the annular details on this type. This is type, cut like annulus, you see. This is a membranous annulus which is sheathing on the surface, cottony annulus, a funnel-like annulus, or you can say peronate, just like a funnel-like annulus here. You can see scaly annulus, double ring, double cottony ring around. So a lot of variants. Just putting it as annulus present or absent, you have to note down of what type, whether single or double, whether flaring or otherwise, whether it is it is above the half mark of this type or below the half mark of this type. And the shape of the uh, carpophore also is very important. The vulva, vulva maybe you see the bulbous base and the, the vulva, scaly vulva around the uh, bulbous base. Many a times you miss it. When you uproot it uh, without digging uh, deep into the soil, normally it is left in the soil. This this is flaring vulva in, in case of momenta. You can see the zoned vulva here, saccate vulva here. So a lot of variation. Then wheel structure. You can see the universal wheel, which covers the complete uh, carpophore right from the very inception. Gills are covered, whole carpophore is covered when it opens up, so wheel breaks up. Part of it is left as vulva at the base, and uh, part of it is left as annulus below, and part of it is uh, it's carried over to the pineal surface as scales. So partial wheel here, you can see the cog wheel in case of Clarkinda, you can see this, and it is uh, left in the form of Cortina along the margin and endless here um, on the stripe. <laughs> then color change and macrochemical reactions are very important. I, I told you many of these mushrooms, their flush changes color when exposed to environment, which is taxonomically very important character. These three species you can differentiate just by color change uh, in the field itself there itself. Otherwise, to look at, to begin with, when they are young, they are white in color, subsequently becomes brownish, and in due course, uh, ultimately, by the time you reaches your laboratory, they become black, totally black, everything. So color change, you have to note down in the field itself, so right from, 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 to begin with, whitish to pinkish to reddish to brown to black, or sometimes from whitish to straightway brown to black, and in others, from white to black. So like that, you have a lot of variation. Similarly, in agaricus, you have species uh, whose flesh type flesh changes reddish, and there are species whose flesh changes yellowish. Accordingly, you have ruby centis and flavicentis. So this is an important. Bluing in penulous sinuses is an important diagnostic character. So they have to be noted. You cannot afford to miss it uh, in the field. Then chemical reaction, Schaeffer's reaction on agaricus, and stipe reaction with ferrous sulfate on, on, on uh, fresh stipe, they are very important. And detailed information, you can have it from uh, Singer's monograph, agaricals in modern taxonomy. If you, I tell you one example, with ferrous sulfate, stipe surface turning pink is a positive reaction. In case of Rusula cyanogentha, it is always unchanging, which is a diagnostic character. Just by a ferrous sulfate reaction, you can identify the species, Rasula cyanogentha. Or if it is turning green with ferrous sulfate, you can straightway say that it is Rasula zirempilina. And like that. If Otherwise, if it is giving pink, so it is none of these two species. It can be something else. The sulfur vanillin reaction, stipe surface and gills turns carmine red is a positive reaction. The Sula Manutula, you can straightway identify by putting a sulfur drop of sulfur vanillin on the gills. They turn carmine red. So like that, you have a number of such chemical tests also, which can lead you to almost uh, conclude the identity of the species. So documenting field information is very important. So besides all these characters, what do you need to note down? Habit, habitat, locality, altitude, collection number, date of collection, forest type, soil type, 
associated plant if any and in that you have to uh, you can uh, you have to see the organic connection of the mycelium with the plant roots so you have to note down these on a note paper and it should be tagged to the mushroom packet in which you have packed your mushrooms you have to avoid mixing that is one of the very important aspect besides this you have to note down the ethnomycological data if the people uh, in the field, uh, village people, tribal people, they are using them for what purpose, how they are using for medicinal purpose. All these have to be uh, noted down on a specially framed questionnaire. The information has to be noted down and field characters should be noted down on the field key. I'll come to it. This is a field key we framed long back when we started working on mushrooms and it was uh, ratified and corrected by Rolf Singer. I said it to him and all these characters they have to be field key has to be taken to the field and you have to note down every character of individual mushroom of what type pileus characters you have to note down gill character you have to note down what i have discussed already then stipe characters you have to note down then wheel characters you have to note down then type surface taste etc peppery acrid tardily acrid mild spicy or sour other similarly of what other fruity or aromatic or disagreeable of what color then spore print you have to take that i'll come to it and these are the macrochemical reactions and habitat photograph you have to take and all these things have to be jotted down on a single uh, field key uh, largely uh, and these are the questions of sociobiological concern which you have to ask the local people do they eat, eat mushroom who in the family collect mushrooms, which type of mushrooms are treated as edible, who taught you about collecting mushrooms, and all such features which are of ethnomycological importance, they have to be jotted down. That will give you a lot of important information. Then, when the specimen is fresh in the laboratory, you have to take the spore print. For that, you have to remove the pileus and place it upside down, gills facing the uh, white paper, or you can put it on the slide. Largely, we used white paper and we create a uh, small chamber, moist chamber with a cotton plug, moist and cotton plug, and we, we put up a uh, petri plate over it and we place it uh, for some time. Those mushrooms which are fleshy, and which are uh, they give you spore print within half an hour and those which are dry they will take some about one hour or so for the spore print to appear and the spore print color has to be noted down by comparing the color with the standard color chart that is obligatory requirement and then you have to dry these spore prints on a gentle heat and subsequently pack them and for further uh, use in study this is how the spore print appears after these are the yields and these are the impressions of spores for spores study they are all mature spores which you should use for study purposes then drying and preservation is an important aspect all mushrooms they are preserved in the herbaria in dried form in dried form so you have to if you wish to work out from the fresh specimens you can preserve a portion of it uh, in 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 uh, some preservative like this uh, it is given rectified alcohol formalin and distilled water you can preserve a small portion of it for working from the first specimen otherwise and there is no problem in working with the dried specimen you have to revive it only with two uh, percent or five percent kvh and then subsequently wash it and use it uh, for uh, investigating microscopic uh, characters uh, you have to cut freehand sections for that and then once you have dried, you have to submit the dried specimens in, in standard herbarium packets with some insect repellent, one uh, for dichlorobenzene we used. And uh, they have to be kept in cardboard boxes and all information about the identity of the collector, classification, locality, etc., herbarium number that has to be pasted on the herbarium packet. This is the improvised mushroom dryer because uh, at that time when we used to work, there were a lot of places in Chakrota and in part of, uh, say, Sona Market, etc., there was no electricity at all. So no question of using uh, electric dryers. So we made an improvised uh, wooden dryer uh, with the uh, and uh, we used 500 wattage heater 
for for drying the mushrooms the the fleshy uh, large sized mushrooms were kept in the lower chamber and the the thin in the upper chambers and like that there were three chambers in this and the uh, proper uh, hot air drying was done by using this mushroom dryer <laughs> for microscopic observations as for beginning of microscopic examination start uh, is concerned. It started with uh, study of internal structure of mushrooms by none other than Robert Hooke, who examined several mushrooms and described the texture to be made of small filaments. At that time, there was no, uh, never, uh, no information about the architecture of these mushrooms, whether they are made of high fear like that. He said they are made up of small filaments. Fair distinguished fundamental tissue and connective tissue in agaricals and subsequently conducting tissue which is involved in the excretion and secretion of and transport of substances. Hyphal context uh, may be homeomerous or heteromerous. It, it may be purely of hyphal uh, made up of hyphae or hyphae and some rounded uh, spherical cells. And then we call heteromerous. Then Schaeffer was the first to recognized trigmata on which basidia, basidiospores are formed. Pursoon introduced the term hymenium. Levely introduced the term basidium and cystidium. And Asharchan was the first to observe the spores of several species of garrix uh, are born at the end of the stalks, projecting from the cylindrical structure, and usually were four in number. It was the first observation, historical aspects of these. So important directions for microscopic observations. Number one, basidiospores should invariably be studied from the spore deposit because these are the mature spores. Spore characters with respect to size, shape, wall, thickness, presence or absence of germ pore, ornamentation, metachromatic reaction, etc. already should be noted. Anatomical details should be noted by cutting freehand sections of mushrooms, not by teasing. You lose many characters by teasing. It is not the way to do mushroom taxonomy. Microscopic details of epicutis, context, hymorophoral trauma, presence or absence of cystidia, and other taxonomical features, they have to be observed under compound microscope. And where uh, you find unique characters like spore ornamentations or say, say epic pore, etc. So you can do electron microscopy also. For clarity, sections should be mounted in 1% cotton blue lactophenol or in Congo red. So these are fungal infection uh, stains. So this, this is the microscope, Nikon microscope we use at that time. And now you have with attached to camera lucida, you have now microscopes available. You can use them and Line drawing, camera lucida drawing is an obligatory requirement. We had uh, during MSI conference on February 20, uh, from 22nd to 24th uh, this year uh, at Patiala. So we had a lecture by Hibbert. And he also emphasized the relevance of line drawings. It is an obligatory requirement. You cannot see the arrangement of tissue by teaching. You have to see them cut the sections and see the arrangement and draw the individual drawings to their dimension. And you have to give scale for every 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 uh, drawing you have drawn. So Pileus details with respect to uh, cuticle, of what type cuticle is there, what is its composition, the presence or absence of cystidial structures, presence or absence of different uh, cuticular elements, etc. And the context details, presence or absence of Clamp connections, they are important aspects which needs to be looked into. You can see the variation in pileus cuticle. If you tease it, you are not going to get the arrangement, how, how the these uh, elements are arranged in the pileus cuticle. Hymenidum, typical cellular type of cuticle you find in a number of species of coprinus, cetherella, etc. Gelatinized cuticle. You can see the cellular elements, how they are arranged. Trichoderm being formed here, uh, here, extension. So you can see this, these elements like this. There's a lot of variation as for uh, this, cuticular, uh, this cuticular organization is concerned. You can see in different genera how, how they are. Even within the same genus, you find a lot of variation. See, lactarius, look at the cuticle variation in lactarius. 
this these are the three and the fourth one here like this so a lot of variations and you this variation you get only through sectioning how the things are arranged within the within the uh, whole structure variation in pileus cuticle in a single genus rasula cutis type trichoderm type palisade type an exocutis type, slightly gelatinized exocutis type. Within the same genus, you have a lot of variations. So these are taxonomic character, how you get it. Besides this, cuticular elements on the pileus surface, you can see the variation in cuticular elements, all different within the same genus. So a lot of variation. These are dermatocysterial elements on the surface. They need to be looked into. There are stains available. That many of them, they stain differently. Similarly, the type details are very important, but type don't give as many characters as uh, are available in the pileus detail. Uh, that is uh, one aspect. You can see the gelatinized surface of the cuticle, the, the turf of colossus studia on the surface. You can see the clamp connections on the type tissue. Many a times you find clamp connection throughout. In many of these species like Rusula, Lactarius, uh, and uh, Lactifluus, no clamp connections are there. So this is a diagnostic character of the these genera. The stipe cuticular details, you can see the variation within the same genus in stipe cuticular details. So these are the character. These are from our own uh, specimens, which we have collected and investigated and worked out uh, and present, presenting here. Even the wheel, the annulus, the vulva, the tissue of annulus and vulva, they offer you interesting character. Many of them, the, you may have cellular elements within the uh, vulva or annular el uh, wheel. You may have only hyphal elements. Hyphae may be narrow, they may be broad, or the elements may have clamp connection, they may not have clamp connection. All such characters needs to be documented. Then hymenophore and associated sterile structures. So hymenophore is uh, basically associated with spore formation and construction of trauma is very important. Maybe homeomerus, heteromerus, and arrangement of trauma hyphae is another important character. Then basidia. Generally, basidia are as broad as the spores and about two to five times as long as the longer axis of the spores. Any variation, this is a normal character, any variation from this, you find variation from this is a taxonomically important character. In coprinus, there is variation in basidia morphology. Basidia may be dimorphic, may have two types of basidia, or even tri trimorphic in shape. Then structure of cystidia. Cystidia, they are the sterile elements. They are the sterile elements on the surface. They are. On the surface of the pileus, gills, as well as the stipe. So four types of hymenial trauma has been recognized. Unilateral hyphal arrangement. Hyphae may be parallel or subparallel. Hyphae may be interwoven in the hymenophoral trauma. Or hyphae may be bilateral. They may be divergent. Hyphae extend downwards or they may be convergent differently. So you can see here, these are parallel running hyphae in the hymenophoral trauma. They are parallel running or they may be interwoven, intricately inter intertwined with one another or divergent, extending from center outwards, inverted V type, inverted V type. You can see the arrangement like this, inverted V type. And here you have V type arrangement, convergent, converging hyphae, converging from the subhymenium into the center of the Lamellae, like that you have variation. If you have convergent hyphal arrangement, straight away go to uh, Plutiaceae, Volvariella, etc. You have divergent arrangement, go to Amanitaceae, Amanita, etc. So like that, you have these characters, which are very important. Cystidial types, lot of variation in these sterile elements on the hymenophore and on the pileus and stipe surface. Those present on the sides of the lamellae are referred as pleurocystidia. Those present on the edges of the lamellae are referred as chelocystidia. And on the surface of pileus and stipe are referred as dermatocystidia. So pileus, pilocystidia, stipe, colocystidia. So besides hymenial cystidial structures are further categorized as macrocystidia. They are large sized, 
thick walled cystidia. Pseudocystia, they are high fat cystidial elements, which originate from this hymenium, sub hymenium extending much beyond the hymenophore. Chrysocystidia, which are yellow, having yellow refractive body and which stain golden when stained with ammonia. Like that, parasystidia, little differentiated cystidia. Leptocystidia, thin walled cystidia without remarkable contents, which are excretory in. Function. So like that, you have a lot of variations and you have to look into these variations. If you look corticioid members, there's still huge amount of variation as far as this studial structure is concerned. These are different types of cystidia in metabloids in penulus. Largely, you find lecithiform cystidia in conocyphe. You have get this type of cystidia are there straight away. Look at the conocyphe. You can reach the genus straight away. If you have artery form like this, Cystidia satirella. So you have a lot of variation yes, as far as these cystidial elements in the hymenium are concerned. There are microchemical tests with cystidia. So macrocystidia, dermatocystidia, olifers, they stain blue in sulfovanilin, brown in sulfoformol, blue in chlorovanilin. Cystidia, basidia, hyphae, and dermatocystidia. They stain rose to carbon red in sulfovanilin, hyaline in sulfoformol, and rose colored in chlorovanilin. So they have uh, immense characters, uh, features which can be of uh, importance as far as taxonomic segregation is concerned. Presence or absence of clamp connection is very important. I have already told you, uh, Rusula lactarius lactifluus in Rusulaceae, they lack clamp connection. So. Uh, it's a important character. If any of the genus uh, of the species of these genera is having connection, it becomes all the more important. Then basidiospores offer immense features uh, which are fairly constant from taxonomic point of view. They, have, they give you a lot of variation as far as expo exosporial ornamentation is concerned. You can see in different genera the variation in basidiospore morphology, uh, all these things. If you have this set of basidiospores, uh, straight away go to Rusula lactarius or lactifluus or family Rusulaceae. So, like that, you have some unique features as far as these spores are concerned. And for uh, noting down the exosporial ornamentation, Singer has recognized 12 different types of exosporial ornamentation. Uh, so these has to be looked into and accordingly you have to classify the ornamentation as per the details. They are available in the monograph of Singer. So I have given you a few of them, type ornamentation type five. You can see the, the, the blunt warts, some of them joined with connections here and there. Uh, here you have blunt warts and there's hardly any connection between the uh, from ward to ward, hardly any ward to ward connection. They are free from one another. You can see here, you can see some, some wards and plage in the center. You can see the connections here. You can see catenulate rows, chain like rows being formed. And you can see the winged, winged, you can say, ornamentation. So, a lot of variation. And these are unique, unique to the species. And they have to be noted down if such. Uh, Arrangement is there straight away. You have to go for electron microscopic studies. Then reaction of spores and tissues with reagents is an important aspect. We have iodine reagent, Melzer reagent. We also call it Lugol's solution. So spores, light spore agarics, in them these uh, react with Melzer reagent is an obligatory requirement. It has to be performed. So spores may be in amyloid when put in uh, uh, this uh, Melzer's reagent, spore or tissue do not change color or react faintly. We call it in amyloid, negative reaction. Amyloid, it is a positive reaction. Spores, when stained with this, they stain blue or blue-black. Dextrinoid, they stain reddish or reddish brown. It is uh, basically uh, uh, dextrinoid or, or pseudoamyloid reaction. This is how it is categorized. Then with chrysyl blue, we perform metachromatic reaction of spores. So in metachromatic reaction, pure dye stains a tissue section in hue perceptibly, perceptibly different from the color characteristic associated with the dye. Dye is blue, but the stain which appears on the tissue 
when we put a dye is altogether different from the blue stain just like we use in large number of spores when chrysal blue is used as a stain so inner spore wall stains purplish red and such spores we this is a metachromatic reaction uh, which is performed then reaction with acetocarbon cyanophilus reaction tissue or basidia turns uh, red in acetocarbon cytophilus reaction cytophilus tissue especially in basidia uh, when heated in acetocarbon uh, it darkens dramatically similarly spores in h2so4 in cetrilacy when h2so concentrated h2so4 is put on the basidial spores the spores of cetrela genus all cetrela genus become slate colored and spores of uh, peniolus genus they do not lose color so this is how you can differentiate in in cetriloidy and peniloidy two uh, you can say sub classes of cetrilacy so both the uh, both are members of family cetrilacy so this this is how these uh, chemical reactions are very important then spore measurement besides measurement of microscopic structure in microns uh, spores has to be measured the unique character uh, and these uh, approximately from every collection 20 spores have to be measured and your your data has to be multi collection based that is very important in taxonomy so basidius spore measurement measurements are represented uh, represented in q value this is this is the formulation which you you take measurement of about 20 spores you have minimum measurement you have average measurement you have highest measurement you take average of minimum and average of maximum measurement and you put it in 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 this formulation lowest mean value for the measured collections this is the greatest mean value for the measured collection that standard deviation put in this formulation and you will get the uh, q value uh, here so this is very important all the measurements of microscopic structures are given in minimum and maximum value so besides macroscopic and microscopic characterization not much work has been done on chemical and numerical characterization of mushrooms there are only few examples and these these two areas they offer lot of opportunities to investigate it has been uh, referred that some characters uh, like uh, like like secondary metabolites profile uh, may be species specific so quantitative analysis of certain specific carbohydrates acids etc are also useful in taxonomy heme and romagnesi found that high percentages of allantoic acid present in coprinus and leucocoprinus as against the low percentages in macroleplota show certain chemical affinity so you can show some affinity on the basis of presence of such chemicals uh, between coprinus and leucocoprinus and increase the hiatus Uh, difference between leucocoprinus and macroleplota they belong to all together different classes taylor justified the separation of coplandia and peniolus on chemo taxonomical ground but however now on the basis of molecular systematic studies coplandia has gone into peniolus it is now instead of coplandia sinensis it is now coplandia it is now peniolus sinensis so it has merged with peniolus rubber studied 39 species vinos ib on chemo taxonomic grounds and show its value value of chemo taxonomic characters at infra generic level they can be of use but not much has been done in this regard we don't have much information similar is with numerical taxonomy and uh, numerical taxonomic analysis of data obtained through detailed examination of basidio carp and somatic structures were conducted to develop objective classification scheme for lacaria in north america by miller muller numerical taxonomic analysis of cultural characters are useful for taxonomic analysis and to study taxonomic relationships these characters support not only the close relationship between bolids and uh, gastromycetes uh, but also the generic circumscription of genera such as lacaria and lactarius but Uh, not much information is available so these are open areas for investigation 
So latest approach in mushroom taxonomy is uh, a phylogenomic approach where whole genome or transcriptome data is intertwined together. It is basically it is a, basically a study of evolutionary relationship. So in this initially to begin with ITS based phylogenetic uh, approaches were uh, there. Uh, they were based on ribosomal RNA genes, RDNA, and subsequently uh, these small subunit and large subunit RDNA are generally applied at high taxonomic level, then multi-copy genes, protein coding genes, non-functional DNA fragments, and single copy uh, protein coding genes. Uh, all these are being now used because these protein coding genes and non-functional DNA fragments and single copy genes, they provide relatively higher resolution as compared to single gene phylogenies. And uh, uh, these multi-copy genes, they are comparatively highly conserved within the species as compared to amongst the species. So that is why these have been uh, of much relevance as far as uh, intricate, solving the intricate taxonomic problems is concerned. The next lecture is on molecular taxonomy. So uh, I have not included any part of molecular taxonomy here. Just uh, one slide I have put up that this at present, along with traditional taxonomic approach, uh, new sequencing strategies and bioinformatic approaches has uh, revolutionized the whole process of uh, taxonomy. And a uh, lot of uh, taxonomic intricacies have been solved. and. Uh, all whatever has been done earlier, even the singers, agaricales in mono, uh, modern taxonomy, the various genera included there, various families included there, many of them has lost relevance. Uh, the earlier classification has lost relevance because of the new findings that have been there based upon these uh, phylogenomic studies. So scientists are now trying to understand the higher level of relationships amongst lamellate mushrooms and their non-lamellate relatives by sequencing genes coding for several specific non-coding ribosomal DNA regions like ITS, NLSU, NSSU, alpha and beta tubulin, elongation factor 1A, chitin synthase, histone, peroxidases, mitochondrial non-coding genes like MTSSU and protein coding genes such as and these included here. So gene of choice is being used for sequencing now and efforts are on for DNA barcoding of mushrooms. So this has revolutionized and what we do when we have gathered all this information uh, on the field key and we have done every exercise uh, as far as external and internal, the working out external and internal details are concerned, then we put these into taxonomic keys. There are standard monographs available, and we put these into standard keys. We have to look for to which order our specimen belongs to. So we have to see the uh, key for the order, whether the specimen belongs to polyporales or agaricales or rusulales. Accordingly, we have to look in, uh, into the uh, standard monographs and we have to uh, categorize our specimen into the specific orders where it belongs to. And subsequently, then uh, once we have placed the specimen in a specific order, then we have to <clears throat> look into the families. Uh, we have to look for the family to which family our specimen belongs to. So we have to put into family key. That is how we go uh, systematically from orders to families and then from families to the genus. We have to look for the genus, say our specimen belongs to Cethrelacy. So we have to look in Cethrelacy to which particular genus. So say we have these three, Japanulus, Coprinopsis, Cethrela. Sporocarp sometimes bluing on bruising, lamellae variegated, spores not bleaching in concentrated sulfuric acid state with Peniolus. Sporocarp never bluing or bruising, lamellae dark brown to black, spores bleaching in concentrated sulfuric acid. So these are the two genera. Uh, of Cetrelacy. So you can, that way, you can segregate on, on these, uh, using these uh, macroscopic and microscopic characters, reach a generic level, and subsequently 
to species level. You have reached the genus, say Satyrella, and then subsequently put, see, keys of Satyrella are available. There are monographs on Satyrella by A. S. Smith. So you can see and look for uh, the characters which fits in, in the diachronomous key, and uh, you find out uh, the specific key. And this is followed by detailed taxonomic description of individual species in the sequence of their segregation in the key. Uh, so say you have Satrilla candoliana. So first taxonomic description will be of this specimen, second this, and like that. In the same sequence, you write it in the monograph. So writing a description and identification is a huge exercise. And for writing a description, you have already found out the name of the species, write the name, write the citation, exact citation, if it is already described species. If it is not a described species, then you have to uh, treat it otherwise. If it is already described, you have to look for its synonyms also. You have to, uh, mycobank number is there, a new species. You have to write diagnosis. In, in now, you can write it in English language. Earlier, uh, writing in Latin language was obligatory requirement. If a new species, you have to give name also and etymology. On what basis you have named the species, whether on the basis of the habitat or on the basis of specific character or locality or, or what character you have used for naming. Accordingly, you have to give few lines of diagnosis, diagnostic characters, few lines on entomology and macroscopic characters, microscopic characters, fruiting phenology. Fruiting phenology, the information about fruiting phenology, you can get only uh, if you have a, a huge data of, uh, say, many years uh, about your collection, say, uh, you have to see when the fruiting comes, in which month it starts fruiting, and up to what extent it goes. Say, some of the species, say, Marshala esculenta, it starts fruiting in March, and you find it in up, to, up till in September. So like that, you have to uh, write the uh, total information about the which at what time it is appearing and at what time it is disappearing. Edibility status, ethnic information, distribution, ecology, and association. Collection examine, including extra limited. If you have uh, borrowed some collections from type material from other herbaria for making comparisons, you cite them as extra limited collections. And besides this, identification should be done by consulting authentic literature. In case of new taxa, and looking into the species complexes and intricate taxonomic problems, molecular sequencing is a must. Many a time, we are receiving papers. I was associated with Kavaka, and we are receiving a paper just doing straightway molecular taxonomy uh, without uh, doing morphology or doing morphology in a sketchy manner. So there are a number of wrong sequences deposited in the NCBI gene bank also. So until unless you, you, you approach the specimen in a systematic manner, looking at its morphology, looking at its anatomical details, looking at its other details, reactions with different chemicals, and then going to molecular systematics, and that, that will give you exact, uh, you can say, identity. The taxonomic description should be based on the characters derived by examining multiple collections. Single collection-based taxonomy is always erroneous. So derived materials, whatever you have collected, they have to be deposited in a recognized herbaria, recognized herbaria. Uh, so uh, it has to be there, and the sequences should be deposited in NCBI gene bank. And description of each taxon should be accompanied with field photograph, photomicrograph of internal details, electron microscopic uh, details of uh, the unique features like uh, spore ornamentation, etc. And every drawing should be followed with magnification line. So these these are important aspects. Limitations of traditional taxonomic approach. Most common limitation of traditional morphology based taxonomic analysis is overlapping morphological features. And this has basically resulted in some of the erroneous 
conclusions. We find number of, uh, you can say, taxa, they have become obsolete. One such example I give you, a phylloforase. It was a huge order, a phylloforase at our times, and now it has become obsolete. All members have gone into agaricomycetes. Similarly, erstwhile agaricales has been divided into number of orders, tricolometales, canthrilales, russulales, polytales, etc. So similarly, the studies with molecular phylogeny have now demonstrated that many morphologically similar taxa represent altogether a distinct lineage than their earlier morphologically similar counterparts. In family coprinaceae, a lot of, uh, you can say, uh, changes have occurred. We have coprinus cometus. It was in coprinaceae, but now, or after molecular examination, it has gone into agaricaceae. It is no more in coprinaceae. Similarly, uh, coprinopsis atramentaria, it has gone into cethrilaceae. Coprinus disseminatus, it has also gone into cethrilaceae. So like that, copilendia, sinuses. It has gone into penulus, penulus sinuses. So a lot of changes are occurring and a lot of things are getting unsettled, which were earlier established. So also many well-known species are turning out to be species complexes. In, in them, genus like Pleurotus, here section Pleurotus, Pleurotus osteatus is a species complex with Pleurotus pulmonarius, Pleurotus plantodes, and all having monometric hyphal system. Pleurotus ringei is also another species complex. So like that molecular te techniques are quite helpful in deciphering such complexes. That is, uh, that is basically the help the molecular techniques are rendering. And a lot of, uh, you can say, changes are taking place. And these uh, basically uh, were the intricacies which uh, were posing some problems and uh, these are some of the limitations with the traditional taxonomy which uh, because of uh, similar such features they were clubbed together uh, in one family or in one genus so they have gone this area in different families the coprinacy has gone far and wide corticium one of the <clears throat> in corticoid fungi uh, corticium has gone into number of, uh, you can say, lineages. It forms base of number of lineages, uh, like uh, Rusulesi, Rusulales, etc. So they've turned out to be a heterogeneous aggregate of similar looking fungi, uh, many of which are almost at the base of every agaricoid lineage. So otherwise, uh, because of looking at the morphology, earlier uh, investigators put them as uh, species of corticium or amongst the corticoid fungi. So like that, a lot of things have changed now because of the intervention of these uh, molecular taxonomic sequencing techniques and bioinformatics tools. Future approach, future of fungal taxonomy is quite challenging. There is a need for polyphasic approach. So there is a paradigm shift in monograph-based identification, especially in case of novel taxa, where confirmation through intervention of molecule sequencing data has become obligatory. Although traditional morphological studies are still very important, yet morphology alone is inadequate and far too subjective. Along with traditional taxonomic approaches, taxonomists must incorporate information using modern sequencing techniques, such as phylogenetics, genomics, metabolomics and evolutionary approaches in the taxonomic categorization. So these are this is this is what is required. The polyphasic approach is required to demarcate the species boundaries. This is very important. So coming to the last slide, morphological and anatomical characters of mushrooms, as you have seen, has proved their relevance in the categorization of mushrooms over a period of time. And along with macrochemical and microchemical reactions of mushrooms, basidiospore morphology has also helped a lot in, in solving the taxonomic problems. Of late, molecular sequencing has proved its relevance in solving intricate taxonomic issues and also in understanding the phylogenetic relationships among different taxa. So the conclusions drawn based upon molecular characteristics 
have led to taxonomic revision of many established taxa in canthral ales. A lot of changes have been there. Even uh, the other day, Dr. Hibbert uh, gave us a huge account of changes which uh, have been incorporated through molecular sequencing techniques in the taxonomy of the shiitake. The area of numerical taxonomy and chemo taxonomy in mushrooms offers much scope since not much has been done in these branches as for their application in mushroom taxonomy is concerned. But uh, I think molecular sequencing has solved much of the issues now and uh, that is one thing which has basically complicated the situation to the traditional taxonomists. Otherwise, the present day taxonomists have no option except to master these techniques of molecular systematics and uh, what you call a bioinformatics if they have to succeed. That is uh, the lesson to take home. So thank you very much with this. This is Punjabi University Patiala, insignia of Punjabi University Patiala. So these branches, side branches, represents different religions and all lead to one goal. In Punjabi, we call it Ekonkar. So that is all. So thank you very much. Topic is open for discussion. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If there are any questions, please ask. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, topic is open for discussion. Can I ask? Yeah, let the participants ask any question if they have any. Excuse me, sir. Yes, please. Uh, sir, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Bilkul. Okay. okay. Uh, sir, thanks for the presentation. I mean, of course, lots of things were like uh, totally <laughs> very few things I understand. Actually, myself, I'm just a cultivator. So I think okay. this uh, like this session was more on the scientific uh, part, maybe for the existing uh, professors and scientists. So I just was able to grab around five to ten percent. Uh, till, because, till now. because it is it is basically meant for the beginners identification and categorization of mushrooms the topic mm -hmm. which was given to me by the organizers so it was identification taxonomy identification of mushrooms so it has yes. nothing to do with cultivation mm -hmm. basically. yes sir, yes, sir. So you uh, don't have a, a traditional knowledge of mycology and you are a cultivator uh, obviously, uh, it will not be possible for you to grasp uh, much of the things. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, although, like, I was able to grasp a little bit. Uh, 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 recently, I've been going through some books of mycology. Uh, I mean, just I've started. So maybe because of those, I was able to collect. Uh, so actually, I want to... And so I will, uh, wanted to know, like, uh, for uh, I mean, I do have a plans of maybe within two, three years of like uh, uh, thinking in the line of which uh, the mushroom foraging and all. I mean, like uh, the conduct conducting some some sort of those thing, like with the local tribal peoples of that area. Uh, I, I, I like, I mean, talk with some people regarding that. So I just wanted to know. Like, uh, is there any uh, mushroom identification book for Indian mushrooms? I mean, like, I have noticed lots of books which is written by the, I mean, European peoples and all. So the mushroom which are available on the in their forest, those photos are given and written on that part. Uh, like anything specific, like, sir, maybe you have written might be some book or like some other specifically dedicatedly to our region mushrooms. To which area you belongs to? Sir, I am from Assam, uh, Northeast. Okay, Northeast. Absolutely, there is no book as such available. We are writing, I have uh, written a field guide for mushrooms of Haryana. 
which is under publication it is not yet released then there is there are some monographs written by professor t n lakhanpal from shimla he has okay. written on 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 marshala that is gucci and he has written on amanita and uh, absolutely there is none and uh, here yesterday i was discussing with the dr vp sharma director dmr so they have planned to bring out a book on indian edible mushrooms within a year it has been discussed and i am in their uh, rsc so it, the work has been already assigned to one of the scientists to prepare a directory otherwise on indian mushrooms they have one book which is on their website on mushrooms of india mushroom biota of india something like that okay. it was prepared last year i was associated with it i edited it and it should be available on their website mushrooms of india okay sir exact title i don't remember actually but it it, it is there he told it that soft copy is there on the website Okay, so I mean a DMR website. Yeah, that's what he, Dr. V.P. Sharma told me yesterday. I I inquired about that book whether they have published it. So they told that soft copy is uh, already there on the website, and otherwise it has not been printed as yet. But they are giving it for printing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Correct. I mean, There's so good number of films. Otherwise, for northeast, I I will tell you for northeast, if you have any problem. there is dr kanar das at botanical survey of india okay so kanar das kanar das okay he scientist he, he has worked on mushrooms of uh, sikkim assam all, all northeast okay okay and 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 also there is another scientist dr krishnendu acharya from kolkata university botany okay. department yeah they are uh, they are and they are uh, good people and uh, krishnendu acharya is uh, working with some tribal people also on mushrooms you can work with tribal people you can collect lot of information it is a huge yeah. area which required lot of intervention from interested people because uh, it is uh, lot of information is there with those people who actually venture into this field correct sir on regular basis so krishnendu acharya from kolkata Yeah, he is in Botany Department, University of Kolkata. Krishnendu Acharya. He is a professor there. He was chairman. Now he has left that chairmanship, and he is working a lot with farmers and all such things around mushroom. He is a mushroom scientist. Uh, hello, sir. Yes. Can uh, I get sir, your contact sir, number? Sir, if you yeah, sir, ah, if you don't yes. mind, why yeah, not? Why not? Uh, so can you share the number of both the uh, per concerned person you said the one from bengal and the one from assam yeah so, i i will give you no problem i have it, these numbers okay and so one more thing uh, mm -hmm. like you said about that uh, soft copy that uh, book uh, which is available on dmr website so apart from that so yes. apart from that book can you recommend any other book for the beginners level for uh, like mushroom identification and all this is a basically uh, there is not a single book you, you don't have any such single book on the basis of which you can identify there are such field guides which were written by kanar das has written okay um, some books on uh, mushrooms of northeast he has okay. written he has written but uh, there is no key as such unless you have basic information basic not just by looking at you cannot identify you can yes, not reach the right uh, conclusion uh, you have to work it out taxonomically and or you associate with some good taxonomist you bring information from the field and associate with him he will help you out there is no problem absolutely sure. Sure. so Can you write the number of uh, Dr. Kanar Das? I will give you. Uh, okay, sir. Certainly. Yes, sir. Eight nine zero zero five. Eight nine double zero five. Two nine. Two nine. Zero double nine. Zero double nine. Uh, sir, this is uh, of Dr. Kanar Das. 
Kannada Das. Kannada Das. Kannada Das. Okay. Another number. Another number. Nine four seven four nine. Nine four seven four nine. Seven nine zero. Seven eight. Okay. This this is both the numbers are of Kannada Das. Okay, sir. Okay. So Krishnendu Acharya. Write the number of Krishnendu Acharya. Sir. Eight zero one. Three one. Six seven. Three one zero. Sir, after six seven. I repeat again. Eight zero one. Three one. Six seven. Three one zero. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can give my reference to both of them. No problem. Absolutely. Sure, sir. Yeah, they are quite helpful people. Thank you, sir. So thanks for taking the trouble and. Absolutely no trouble. It is my pleasure and uh, absolutely. Any other question? Please ask. Any service for me? You can contact me also. There is no problem. Absolutely no problem. Sir, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Namaskar, sir. I am yes, sir. Satyajit Mahapatra. Basically, is mushroom grower. Yes, sir. I am talking yes, sir. from Jharkhand. Yes, sir. Uh, I have uh, I have uh, two queries. Yes, sir. Uh, first question. First question is uh, whether we can decide. Uh, Or uh, or we can uh, rectify that uh, a mushroom is edible or not edible. That means poisonous or non-poisonous, on the basis of taxonomy only, or uh, there are some other uh, uh, criteria for that. Absolutely, no criteria, no rule is the only rule. There are that that we <laughs> we say in about mushroom edibility. They almost look alike. There is hardly any. external character it is only you have to know them individually that's all number one pleurotus species you can safely consume there is no absolutely pleurotus you will be able to identify there are number of pleurotus species available in the market they are edible termitomyces all species which grow on termit area they are all edible there is no yes. problem absolutely about them and uh, with regard to others say volvariella have volva amanita has volva and uh, so you may be confused amanita has annulus agaricus has annulus so you need to have some sort of experience in in knowing them otherwise uh, you can differentiate if you are you have a little bit of field knowledge you can differentiate otherwise it becomes very difficult if you are a layman then it is not uh, practically possible then you have is it, to is it, is it possible to the person yeah. not belonging to the scientific uh, community yes sir to, differ, to differentiate between yes uh, the uh, mushrooms yes uh, is it possible for the person who does not belongs to the scientific column, uh, community no no i am not saying that i am telling you you have to develop some contact with the local people who are uh, regularly uh, indulging in mushroom collection they bring only the edible ones because through experience they have learned these is it it okay okay they had field information all information they collect if you go to the field early in the morning say around 5 o'clock in your area you will find number of people hunting mushrooms and collecting and they will collect only those which they are regularly collecting okay but so but you can are, see there some news, there are some news also from the north east region of the country yeah. where uh, people get um, uh, got, um, uh, dead because of the yes yes. yes yes that is how they gain experience absolutely there are number of uh, mushrooms so basically what you need to do is normally the tribal people in chatisgarh i don't know uh, whether in north east this practice is there this is there i, I suppose bringing from the wild and selling in the roadside markets yes 
Okay, there are a number of mushrooms which are being sold in the road, roadside markets, and you find a huge bulk of these are being brought from the wild. So uh, you have to look those mushrooms, gather them, then identify them subsequently. So that can give you an idea. Otherwise, in the field, you cannot basically, unless you have some little bit knowledge of these mushrooms, you will not. It will not be possible for you to make out that this is edible or this is poisonous. There is no as such. Otherwise, we do say that those mushrooms uh, which these rodents eat, they nimble monkeys, squirrels, is it? So, so they are considered as edible otherwise in a layman criteria sir i have one question thank you sir i have heard, sir, have heard the, the, the during boil time uh, the silver spoon we can dip and if it is become black so uh, absolutely it is it is not it, it is not a foolproof I, I told you there is a saying no rule is the only rule in this, in specifically with respect to mushroom, it is a uh, very dangerous preposition to venture into it without. Otherwise, some of them you can collect, say, marshala, which we call Gucci here. You can collect all, all marshala species are edible. All are edible. You can collect them. If you have seen one, you can find them in the field. You can collect them. Termitomyces, if you have, if you know, these those growing on termite area they are edible but should be able to make out pleurotus even lentinous species none of them are poisonous but otherwise in case of agaricus in case of volvariella uh, you may confuse it and there may be a confusion bolates also there is a problem Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, I just want to ask uh, two, two to three questions. So yes. one is like you said just now, like uh, uh, all the species of lentinus are edible. Yes. And sir, at the uh, beginning, where, where, sir, when you are presenting, uh, maybe I heard it wrong, I don't know. Uh, so you, while, while showing, you said once uh, lentinus sajar kaju. Maybe I'm not sure. I heard it wrong uh, or... Yeah, yeah. Because uh, as per my, uh, how much I know, that is like yeah. Sajar Kaju means oyster mushroom, a uh, uh, species of oyster mushroom, pleuritus. And the uh, <laughs> le lentinus. Yeah. Yeah, both are there. Okay, so, and yeah, shiitake both means are uh, like. Lentinus so, Sajar Kaju is also there, a pleuritus Sajar Kaju is also there. Both are there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, so sir, the lentinus means it uh, somehow falls in that uh, shiitake family. Shiitake is lentinula. It is not lentinus. Okay, okay, okay. okay. It is lentinula. It is altogether different. Okay. Uh, earlier it was lentinus idotes, but now it is lentinula idotes. It is altogether different. They belong to different families. Okay, sir. Yeah. And uh, so uh, the other thing is uh, like suppose uh, like we collect some mushroom. I mean, like uh, after going through those uh, books and identification, somehow, like suppose I uh, felt like this is a edible one, non-poisonous, yeah. or yeah. maybe not that poisonous, like the amanita, like which will instantly kill. So, is there is there any uh, institute? in our country to like where we can send for identification, send the mushrooms? As oh. such, there is no institution. Otherwise, uh, when we were at Patiala, we were doing it, uh, identification. We were training people, people who used to come to our lab. Otherwise, also, depending upon your location, I can tell you the person who can help you in identification, there will be no problem, absolutely. OK. Uh, so, yes. uh, yeah, so I guess you have already given me the number. Like I, I'm. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, you will have no problem. Absolutely, Doctor Karnar Das, he is an expert in the field. Absolutely, okay. he is uh, amongst the top. Even Krishnendu Acharya, they are doing a lot of work. And they are expert in the field. They'll help you in identification. Okay.
Correct. And so my last two question. Uh, so like uh, uh, till now, like uh, is there any studies been done uh, uh, for the I mean uh, bioluminescence mushroom in India? Not yet. Absolutely not yet. I I don't have any information as such. Okay. Yeah. There are not many people who are working on mushrooms, basically. Only limited people are there. Everybody, everybody wants to work in the lab. It is yeah. basically a field science. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, sir. Okay. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, please. this is Noor. This is Noor Nawaz, assistant professor from U, uh, U.S. Darwad. Yes, please. please. Sir, recently I read an article in Meghalaya. There were a <clears throat> few species have been identified. Which are bioluminescent? Yes, bioluminescent. It is there. They are there, definitely. But as such, I don't have any information if somebody is working on it. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Locating a bioluminescent machine while into the field, going into the field is another thing. But working on bioluminescent and machines and their mechanism, how it happens, all these things, I don't have any information. I don't think anybody is working. Yeah. Okay, sir. But, but it is a very interesting area, sir. Uh, Definitely. Those who, already, those who are already there in the mushroom field arena, they can take up, sir. Because we are yes, just, we yes. are just beginners now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It is for the beginners to take. We have <laughs> we have lived our times. Now we are professing. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> Any other question? I think we have gone uh, over our uh, allotted uh, quota of time. Can I ask one last question? Yes, sir. Welcome. You ask the organizers. I am there. There is no problem. Keep on asking. Okay, uh, sir. Like uh, you showed one for picture, like uh, how you collected the spores from a wild mushroom. Uh, and you said like uh, for fresh mushroom, uh, very less time is needed for, for taking the spores and for uh, a little bit dry, uh, like um, we need more than half an hour, I think, for collecting yeah. the spores. Uh, so like, is there any possibilities, like suppose uh, the mushroom is very much dry. I mean, there's a chance that we like still get the spores? Not, no, please. It, absolutely not. Okay. They have to be freshly collected and immediately you have to put them for uh, taking spore prints. That's all. Okay. It depends upon the consistency of mushroom. If they are fleshy and there are a lot of moisture, so you will get the spore print within 15-20 minutes. In some of the cases in coprinus, etc., it may take hardly 5-10 minutes and some of them within half an hour and some of them may take uh, even 2-3 hours. It depends okay. upon their consistency. Okay. Correct. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Sir, I think uh, we should uh, call it, uh, call the session to be concluded. Uh, as we have gone way over uh, our allotted time due to the very nice interaction at the end. Uh, sir, on behalf of the participants and on behalf of the organizers, we extend our gratitude to you, sir, for being with us. It was such a pleasure to have you. And uh, most importantly, the interaction uh, was superb. Thank you, sir. Thanks Thank a lot. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. If any help I can render, I am welcome. You are welcome. I, I am, I'll be available. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Yes. Participants can, can enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Peace. Thank you, sir. Peace.